Hey guys, today we're going to talk about pet nutrition. And there's quite a few myths in the pet nutrition world and in the animal nutrition world. And we've covered some of it previously on the animal longevity video, so if you haven't seen that, go ahead and check that out. The link's in the description. But we're going to jump right into it here with dogs. And the dog digestive system is actually very similar to ours. Between the dog and the pig, those two animals might be the closest analogs that we do have for a human digestive system. And therefore, the protocol is actually very similar to have a healthy dog as it is to have a healthy human. Now, believe it or not, we have eliminated the appearance of every disease and birth defect that you can name in dogs with dog food, essentially. And if you look at the labels of dog food, there's going to be a bunch of junk in most of them. But there's a super high nutrient dose in them. This is by law. Whatever country that you're in that has regulations on this is going to mandate that there be a certain minimum requirement of nutrients in it. And this is different from the American FDA or Health Canada or something like that coming out and saying, we need this much B12 per day. That's just a recommendation, right? In animals, it's mandatory. If you're producing an animal food, it has to have these things in it. And these nutrients are going to be giving the animal what it needs to prevent birth defects, to have healthy pregnancies, healthy births, and to avoid the degenerative diseases, especially the bone diseases and all types of things that will be supported by this diet, this supplemented diet, this supplemented food. And this is extremely important because for our protocol for dogs, which is the most common animal that people come to us for advice with, and we're not veterinarians, Dr. Wallach started as a veterinarian, but we're not veterinarians and we're not seeing these animals, we're not dealing with these animals. And the best advice we can usually have is to make sure that they're only eating dog food. Even if it was one of these cheap dog foods, it's the fact of giving it human food is what gives these animals human diseases, believe it or not, right? The, we give the dogs the dog food to prevent the appearance of the same diseases that we are plagued with. And we get those diseases because we're only eating food. The nutrients that we need to support our body, AKA the 90 essential nutrients, by and large are not in the food supply, especially since two thirds of those nutrients are minerals, 60 out of the 90 are minerals. So when we feed our dogs or our other animals, our human food we're throwing off the ratio of the nutrients that are already in the dog food the dog is already being given a serving of food calories with a proportion of nutrients to actual food calories protein fat that balance is what's keeping the animal healthy again even if it's cheap dog food with crappy additives in it it's that it's that ratio of nutrients that is the most important factor for the overall health and longevity of the animal now, I went into length on that because it's 100% of the time I can't come to any examples in my mind of anyone who's ever come to us with a sick dog, a dog with kidney problems, a dog that stopped eating prematurely, you know, several years before it's expected to decline so rapidly. And they're coming to us and I used to ask, are you feeding this dog table scraps, especially meat, liver, anything like that? This is because of the phosphorus ratio. We'll get into that, but I don't need to ask that anymore because I know that's why they're coming to us. The dog is sick. The dog has a human disease, a human disease state because they're feeding it human food. And this is the period on that. And it doesn't matter whether they're feeding them dog food or not. If you're feeding their animal meat or liver or many other foods, you could be throwing off the nutrient balance just like it does in humans again. But the meat particularly and the organ meat, it has such high phosphorus ratios. And since we need to consume calcium and phosphorus together in a specific ratio, when you consume more phosphorus, it increases the need for more calcium. Obviously, the calcium is deficient in the diet in general. This is why humans are plagued with calcium deficiency diseases, of which there are over 200 on the physician's desk reference, including all the arthritis and all the osteoporosis, but also including things that most people don't know, such as insomniac, restless leg syndrome. These are both things that people come to us with their dogs experiencing as well. And of course, vascular problems introduced by inflammatory foods. Now, you notice those dog food labels that i put up earlier a lot of them do have oil in it a lot of them do have gluten in it and a lot of other preservatives and stuff that would not be allowed in human food so when people come to us with a sick dog again generally it's kind of too late if they're in a state of decline just like with humans our our emergency interventions are pretty limited especially if a dog or a human comes to us with a long-term degenerative problem a long-term nutritional problem so the, we want to do the best we can Obviously, we say get rid of the table scraps completely. Don't feed the dog any human food, especially meat. Put it on a gluten-free dog food. There's plenty out there. Look for one that doesn't have oil and grains at all. It's going to be my opinion. If you can get one that's grain-free and oil-free 
And no processed meat is going to be another thing that you want to look out for. This is the same thing on our human food list. The 12 bad foods can get extended from that. But the processed meats is definitely on that. That's anything with nitrates and nitrites or a nitrate mimicker such as celery even. There's no problem with celery, but when the celery is heated and it's used as a preservative, it acts very similarly to a nitrate. So if you're feeding your dog a gluten-free, processed, meat-free, oil-free dog food, that's going to be your best bet. If the dog is experiencing any kind of bone or muscle problems, I would switch the dog to an old dog food formula, no matter how old the dog is. This is mainly because of the increased glucosamine in there and other sulfur compounds that will help with bone and joint health. And keep in mind, guys, we solved this problem in animals, in livestock animals, in China 1,000 years ago. This More than 1,000 years ago. This is all the bone and joint problems. We solved this by using the holistic principle, long known in humanity, known as like cures like. Meaning if an animal has a bone and joint problem, we solve this practically by feeding them bones and joints. And that phosphorus to calcium ratio that we were talking about earlier, nature has provided us with this ratio. We do get this ratio when we consume the whole animal. That's the trick, and that's what we have missed in humans as well. A lot of us are only eating the muscle, maybe the muscle and the organs, but there's a, the rest of the animal that contains the rest of the minerals needed to balance those nutrients. And so when we consume a high meat diet, high organ diet, this can be one of the things that can contribute to osteoporosis, arthritis, or any of the calcium deficiency diseases because we are increasing our phosphorus so much and we are not matching that with the increased intake of calcium. Of course, calcium and its other bone building mineral cofactors are going to be present in bones. So having said that, don't feed the dog any scraps or any treats unless those treats are marketed as bone and joint support. And you'll see that on the label. That's because they have to have this group of nutrients in it for it to qualify as bone and joint support. You can also give the dogs bones like just let them chew on bones that's fine it's not really considered a treat if you are to give the dog any human food at all we recommend eggs and this especially to be in the healing stage of the animal and this is cracked raw into the food maybe mixed into the food the dry dog food or the wet dog food most dogs will just kind of go for it and they'll just eat it and they'll eat the shell also sometimes you need to mix it in a little bit especially if they are sick and they are having trouble eating you break the egg open put it onto the food keep the shells in it again they will eat the shells mix the shell into it that is also going to be an increased source of calcium for them and this is part of the reason why this is the only permissible human food to give your animals on top of dog foods or specifically marketed bone and joint treats or antioxidant treats something like that now, for the sake of full coverage for this dog protocol what i would also do is add raw minerals we sell this our, our raw humic shale plant derived mineral product we do sell it as fertilizer we also sell it as a liquid human supplement and it finds its way into our other supplement products but this is the the cheapest and easiest way to do it in its raw form it would also be the most cost effective way for a human to do it as well the good news about dogs and other pets is that most of them don't weigh very much and supplements and minerals and nutrients they're all based on body weight so for a small dog a little batch of this humic shale fertilizer stuff probably will last its whole lifetime for the bigger dogs a big bag will last the whole lifetime and it's this is a very cheap investment compared to the ongoing cost of dog food and treats and god forbid any medications or anything like that by the way i would not really use any medication on a dog or a cat it's unfortunate that the new generation of veterinarians are pretty much mimicking human medicine with animals now they're recommending hip replacements for dogs they're recommending blood pressure drugs and and blood sugar drugs for dogs and all this kind of stuff anti-seizure medication and again it's a shame that they have been untaught how to keep animals healthy it's no longer their job but now the veterinarian's job is just like a human medical doctor's job which is to manage symptoms manage diseases not to prevent or cure them so if i was to use any medicine with a dog it would be a selenium shot in an emergency situation i would go to an agricultural store i would get a selenium shot that's designed for a goat or a sheep i would do the the math for the weight of the dog and i would give the dog the selenium shot this is only if it's an emergency situation again people often come to us way too late the dog has degenerated significantly again a lot of times people come to us when it's not eating or its kidneys are failing or something like that and at, at this emergency point i would give it a selenium shot because it's one of the only emergency interventions that we have that i would have any faith in working so adding the minerals to its regular diet um, you can message us about the dose by the way or you can do the math you can look it up on what a human dose would be per 100 pounds and guesstimate it you can go overboard there's no harm in going overboard on minerals especially if the dog is sick 
And lastly, I want to mention that radiation also affects animals just like it affects humans. This affects the blood. The blood vessels are what transport around nutrients and oxygen and waste to and from the cells. If the blood cells themselves are affected by radiation, then this is going to affect the overall body's ability to function properly. So one of the miracles that we've seen in this business with humans and animals is by introducing frequency tuning discs. Again, another benefit that dogs don't tend to weigh as much as humans, so one disc is all they need. And again, dogs that have trouble going up the stairs, boom, they can go up the stairs now because of a frequency tuning, tuning disc with no other dietary changes. This is amazing to me. This constitutes a miracle to me. And this represents how much our animals are being affected by radiation, just like we are as well. And of course, we do sell frequency tuning discs for humans, and we also sell them for animals in a little kit that you can rivet into your cat or dog collar and it's a one-time purchase it stays on forever and it's really quite effective and that actually is it for the whole dog protocol that's what i would do someone comes to us with a dog we say switch it to the gluten-free dog food add some eggs add some minerals add a frequency tuning disc that's pretty much it i'm gonna mention here that there's a big myth in all animals and humans actually that birth defects or other abnormalities or retardation maybe mental incapacity is going to be caused by inbreeding and i don't think we have actual any evidence for that we see stocks of animals that are regularly inbred for hundreds of generations or more especially in lab rats and mice but obviously in dogs as well the reason we have purebreds is because they were inbred heavily and now all of a sudden at one point in time they started to have major problems and this is many of the major breeds you know dobermans labs golden retrievers great danes dalmatians the list goes on, pugs, right? They all have their own individual problems and a lot of them are blamed on genetics. Meanwhile, we know just by keeping the stock healthy, by giving, making sure the mother has everything that she needs, making sure that any runts are dealt with, meaning that if a animal, if a, a puppy or a baby rat is being bullied out of food, it's going to be getting less nutrition. It's not gonna grow as fast as its siblings. This effect is actually going to compound out. This is similar to Malcolm Gladwell's concept in Outliers where you know an advantage an early advantage compounds out to success later on you know the the kid who is a little bit older in hockey practice is going to be a little bit bigger than the sibling than the kid who was born 10 months later he's going to get a little bit more of an advantage on the ice therefore he's going to get a little bit more he's going to get more coaching more ice time more practice right therefore this advantage gets greater and greater same with the runs it's the opposite if they get bullied out of food they get less growth meanwhile their siblings get more growth so they get even more ability to bully them out of more food so separating out runts and making sure they get their proper nutrition often runts grow to the same size as their siblings or even greater in some cases but having said this there there's no room for genetics to come in and cause a disease right and many of our famous animal experiments involve inbreeding heavily to prove some other point interestingly i might as well throw it in here with the pet video there was a man in russia who tried to breed a bunch of foxes to become docile and to become friendly and what he found that when this is done by inbreeding and what he found very quickly was that a that was possible in quite a few generations but b their physical characteristics also changed to what we would expect from a docile dog the friendlier dogs tend to have fluffier softer fur they tend to have spots they tend to have droopy ears we tend to think of the aggressive dogs as being pointy and having this tough fur right this strong fur and so he did this in foxes very very quickly it was very interesting and gives you a lot to think about there but this was done by inbreeding right again in the pet industry inbreeding heavily and this is normal practice and we do not expect birth defects as long as we are doing the nutrition properly it doesn't matter whether it's a dog or a cat or a ferret or any of the rodents or any of the reptiles snakes lizards fish inbreeding is the norm birth defects are not the norm because in the industries we give the animals the nutrition in pellet form in dog food form in parrot food form pellet form now in humans this myth shows up because groups such as the amish inbreeding is blamed on a lot of the problems that they have not just birth defects but also things like muscular dystrophy cystic fibrosis and of course we know this in the nutrition world we know this from dr wallach that these people are on selenium deficient soils in fact up here where we live we are on selenium deficient soils if the amish people up here or if we up here were trying to survive purely on what was grown or produced on our land we know we will be selenium deficient and we will experience selenium deficiency problems 
such as muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, sudden infant death syndrome in our children, and all types of immune problems and all this stuff because of course selenium is necessary for our body's ability to utilize antioxidants properly including glutathione, the antioxidant that we produce in most of our cells considered the master antioxidant. So the Amish are not riddled with health problems because of inbreeding. I find that very disrespectful and it's probably not even true. In fact, from what we know up here, the Amish go to lengths to avoid inbreeding and to keep variation in their genetic stock. Actually, this is not talked about a lot, but a lot of groups will actually pay for people outside of their genetic, outside of their community to come and inseminate their women some way, somehow. And this is because they have been told that these birth defects, these problems, these, these degenerative diseases are genetic and that part of this is involved in inbreeding. So they have been led to believe that by adding more variation to their stock that this will reduce. Meanwhile, the Amish that we have worked with in the business have been taught to give themselves selenium just like they would give their cows or their goats or their horses selenium because that's in the animal feed and they give the goat the goat shot before it gets pregnant or before it gives birth because they don't want birth defects this is just standard practice it, these are frugal people and they want to get the most out of their money and a lot of farmers know this already we know this intuitively a lot of people in the in the animal businesses we know this we give these animals these little powders and pellets and foods so that they don't have problems and we don't translate that onto our own selves when we go to our doctor and we're given a, a diagnosis that looks an awful lot like we would see in the animal industry we're talking about muscular dystrophy of course that's known as white muscle disease in animals and it's the exact same disease caused by the exact same deficiency given a different name for no reason other than ignorance um, in the medical industry and possibly in the veterinary industry and their miscommunication or lack of communication here i'm going to mention salt what i've said many times i consider the most important nutrient and this is because you cannot feed any animal just food it needs a source of salt and this is one of the major mistakes that people can have in their dogs or their cats if they're trying to give it a raw diet we already mentioned that it's missing the nutrients so if even if you were to attempt to give it the raw foods plus the raw minerals in adequate doses you would still need to give it a source of salt either by putting salt in the food notice the dog food the cat food is going to have salt in it or again with your larger livestock we give them salt blocks and this is to eliminate the behavior of pica or cribbians when they chew on the fence or chew on the feed box or eat horns and bones that are laying around instead of their feed it's a salt deficiency any mineral deficiency will create abnormal cravings in any animal and a lot of the time that major deficiency is going to be the salt so just keep that in mind this is another reason why the raw food thing really fails heavily with animals especially with dogs and cats cats by the way they're not much extra to say on them other than that they are more heavily carnivore their digestive system is less similar to ours than the dog is meaning the dog can handle a bit more of an omnivorous lifestyle as long as it has that high micronutrient especially that high mineral intake especially again the bone joint minerals the calcium family but with cats it's even more true they do even less well on human food of any kind table scraps of any kind and they fail ultimately more rapidly than dogs in my opinion that's not quantified that's just experience so same thing they would need salt as well in their food some way somehow in nature they would be going out of their way to find salt and we need to provide that for them p.s the most major reason for this would be both because both sodium and chloride are essential nutrients and are needed for numerous things in the body but the chloride is the foundation of stomach acid in both ourselves and animals so when animals or humans are eating a raw diet or just a, a food diet often they fail to put as much salt as they require to digest that food in this causes digestive problems this causes stomach problems this causes things like gastroparesis and a lot of the animals that we've seen on these raw foods eventually they lose the ability to eat because their stomach is not able to produce enough stomach acid to do the job because of a lack of salt long term so i've mentioned most of the main points that i wanted to cover in this video and most of these points will apply to pretty much every animal that you can consider the only other thing that i want to consider is social environment the social environment a lot of animals will do very very poorly in a poor social environment and this includes lab rats and mice we're not going to get into it but there's a lot of research showing how poorly lab rats and mice do when they're isolated on their own as opposed to being in a community and a bigger cage kind of thing just basic amenities but giving a, a hamster a wheel is not necessarily going to make it happy and it's not going to expand its lifetime this is particularly true in birds and monkeys actually a lot of people think that you can have a monkey as a pet as long as you can afford it it's just not true 
the you can have a monkey before it hits mon uh, sexual maturity and then as soon as it does it will kind of go crazy on you we had our first fight this morning <laughs> this is pretty much a guarantee and by brain analysis this shows that their brain is actually degenerating as well um, so they're getting brain damage by the lack of a social environment we've seen this in elephants again just suffering in zoo environments as well unless they're put into a herd and give, given adequate room and such so this can be an important consideration with a lot of animals and this is why a lot of animals are, are not considered good pets especially monkeys it's probably considered cruelty even to separate them and same thing a bird can be a a parrot especially can be a long-lived beautiful intelligent animal and something even close to a friend but if you leave it on its own it's going to suffer and it's going to die young and it's probably going to develop what we would consider nutrient deficiency diseases as well and probably will stop eating in many cases and there's some things to mention here uh, like in reptiles you know we talked about giving the powders and such to animals but I've seen this in the reptile business that a lot of people just fail to take that advice. They take their snake home and they feed it a live mouse. First of all, that's not recommended in the animal in the pet industry because if you feed your snakes or lizards live rodents, in some cases, those rodents can get a bite onto your snake. It can take an eye out. It can kill the snake. Truthfully, it can bite right through the neck. And this is it. This is kind of graphic, guys. I'm sorry for anybody who's not prepared for the graphicness of it. But if a snake is wrapping up, if it's constricting a rat and the head is free, that head is going to be biting down on whatever it can get. And it can really hurt the snake. It can kill the animal. It can kill the pet. People pay a lot of money for some of these reptiles. And so we don't recommend this in general. So we recommend feeding it already dead thawed out frozen mice or rats but you have to stuff it with minerals and vitamins or it not only is it not going to live as long as it can but it is going to develop a problem and most likely at one point in time it's just going to stop eating it's going to develop a disinterest in food and again in the wild there are many sources of nutrients especially puddles puddles are a big underappreciated source of plant derived minerals because all types of organic material falls into puddles especially where a lot of these snakes are there's lots of leaves and other things and that's leaching plant derived minerals into the water and it's consuming a lot of it and it's this is where it's getting its water a lot of times it's sitting in the puddles for long periods of time i imagine it's absorbing it through its tissues just like sea creatures don't necessarily need to consume the minerals from the sea because they're bathed in it so their bodies are having access to this and this might be too detailed but again lots of people have these pets and they know that those powders are there to put on your crickets and a lot of people don't do it but if you do do it in the industry of reptiles we have doubled tripled quadrupled sometimes even more than that the lifespans that these animals are said to have they have spectacular health and spectacular results in all types of new um, breeds new types new designs new sizes of these animals because they become designer this is a this is a major hobby and it's been a fantastic thing by doing their nutrition correctly and having great healthy stocks several generations on while still being inbred and there's many tricks here too even with crickets if you're keeping your own stocks of crickets to feed or cockroaches or you know a lot of these insects that we, you would use to feed a lot of different animals when you feed them something like high omega-3 fish food first of all the cricket in a lot of cases it starts to glow neon color it'll, it'll look pink bright pink or something like that and you can just tell even by looking at it that it is, it's a super nutritious creature all of a sudden and that changes quick you can see that in a matter of days a colony of crickets or, or cockroaches become vibrant and bigger and juicier and uh, in my experience again this is not quantified but even the smell changes of the colony a little bit when they're being fed different foods so all of this is to consider changes to our own human nutrition that's the reason why going into this first of all a lot of people come to us with pet dilemmas and we want to just make this video and keep that there for them but all these things apply to humans as well the reason that we have these problems in our human colonies is because we are neglecting this information that we do know from animals and that goes right to the social thing as well right if we have monkeys that get brain damage if they're not in contact with other monkeys and we're living in little boxes in, in apartment buildings and, and you know we're socially distant from each other and all this stuff that's been big talk for many decades of course this is going to be affecting our health we know this from animals this will affect our longevity it will affect our chances of getting a disease of developing a disease and all this kind of stuff overall low life quality so that is pretty much what i had to say on all these topics yeah, 
could mention rodents and all this as well is still going to apply feed them the pellets minimize the rest of the foods if you're going to add other foods in increase the minerals somehow and hopefully we all have some healthy animals here and hopefully we prevent a lot of these problems from developing and we stop this trend in the industry of disease management and symptom management and this craziness like giving surgeries to dogs and such and by the way it's worth I don't, I don't know how it's worth saying i don't know how it needs to be said but don't put masks on your animals it's crazy it does not help them at all and this is really not a good idea in humans either in our opinion but that's another topic so for now i appreciate all you guys time let me know if there's anything else you'd like to see covered in these types of videos and until then we'll see you next time